Well, happy Easter again, everyone. Happy Easter. Today we celebrate the central message of Christianity, that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again to new life. Easter is a time of hope. It's a season of rebirth. It's an opportunity to come back to life. Because of Easter, we have been given the promise of eternal life. The gates of heaven are now open to us. But Easter also holds the promise of a more fulfilling life now, a better life, a life full of hope and peace. In fact, the very first word that Jesus said to his disciples after he rose from the dead, the very first word was peace. He came to them and he said, peace be with you. So today I want to talk with you about finding peace in an un peaceful world. Every day presents opportunities for us to be worried and anxious. Turn on the news and you'll soon start worrying about the state of our world. Talk to some people and they will rob you of your tranquility. Family struggles can knock you off balance. A troubling diagnosis, a sharp word from your boss, an unkind gesture from a stranger, a bad dream, or many other daily developments can unsettle you and undermine your sense of peace. To be honest, I worry. I worry all the time. I always have. As a child, my stomach would often be upset from anxiety, and my mother would make me warm honey milk to try to soothe my nerves. But I still worried. Today, I'm the king of worry. <laughs> I worry about everything. I worry about disappointing people, letting them down. I worry about complaints. I even worry when things are going well. When we started our small groups for Lent, I worried that not many people would sign up. When we exceeded our goal, I worried that we wouldn't be able to get all those people into the groups that they wanted. When that worked out, I worried that they weren't going to like the experience and would leave. None of it happened. God took care of it all. But I still worried. <laughs> we all want a sense of peace, especially in the storms of life. And worrying excessively can actually do a lot of harm to us. It can do a lot of damage. It can affect our mood make us irritable and put us on edge. It can interrupt our sleep. It can tempt us to turn to bad habits as a way of coping with anxiety. It can harm our physical health sometimes if it's extreme. Excessive worry can even prevent you from relaxing and enjoying the good things of life. Before I was a priest, long ago in another era, I was a lawyer. And I remember when I first started with my first law firm, uh, I was invited to a social gathering. It was like a welcome party for all the new young lawyers. It was at the home of one of the partners. And sometime in the evening, the partner's wife gathered all of us young attorneys together because she wanted to impress upon us the importance of maintaining a work-life balance. To illustrate her point, she told us about uh, a terrible vacation, a fate, one fateful vacation that her family took. She had booked a beautiful room, a hotel room, right on the beach. She had made reservations at the best waterfront restaurants. The kids had packed all their toys. Everyone was ready to go and was excited about the trip until her husband, fearing that something would go wrong at work while he was away, decided at the last minute to pack the fax machine. <laughs> Do you remember what those are? Kids have no idea what I'm talking about. They're this big, huge machine that people used to send. It would be like an email. You had to stick this thing and then somebody else would get it across the world or the nation. He packed the fax machine. And when she said she saw this, she knew the vacation was doomed. It was doomed. You know, fretting over the past and worrying about the future, it's, um, it's like an albatross that we choose to carry around. 
I ran into a friend at a conference recently. She had this huge bag on her shoulder. I mean, enormous. And she was walking around the conference center with it. And because I can be nosy and rude sometimes, I just asked her, what's in the bag? I mean, it's such an oversized bag. What is in it? She said, well, it was her computer. And she didn't want to leave it in the hotel room out of fear that it would get stolen, even though the room had a secure safe. All day long, she lugged around that heavy, enormous bag because she was afraid of something that probably would never happen. That's what excessive worry can do to us. It can be like carrying a weight everywhere we go. Maybe you dream of the day when you're caught up with everything you have to do and you can have a sense of peace. Or that morning when you're finally able to wake up feeling refreshed and not worried about the day ahead. Or that time when you can finally take that dream vacation, that luxury vacation and sip margaritas on the beach without being anxious about everything that's going on back home. The problem is that day, that morning, that time may never come. It may never come. One of my favorite movies is a romantic comedy called While You Were Sleeping. Anybody ever see that? While You Were Sleeping. It's Christmas time in Chicago and Sandra Bullock plays a, a young woman named Lucy who falls in love with a man that she's never actually spoken to. One day, he is attacked on the subway, and he slips into a coma. And when Lucy comes to visit him in the hospital, his big, chaotic, crazy, Catholic family mistakes her for the fiancé they've never met. Well, one thing leads to another, and at the end of the movie, Lucy winds up falling in love with the man's brother, Jack. Jack works for his father in the estate furniture business. He has not had the heart to tell his dad that he doesn't want the business. He wants to start his own business. He has a dream of starting his own business. Well, one day after Christmas, he works up the courage. So he comes over early one morning with a box of donuts. He sits down with his father at the family table. Everyone else is asleep. The house is quiet. But before Jack can tell his father the truth, his dad says to him, you know, Jack, you work hard, you try to provide for the family, and for one minute, everything's good. Everyone's well, everyone's happy. And for that one minute, you have peace. Jack looks at his father, smiles, and says, Pop, this isn't that minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to be at peace when life is good, and everything's great, and everyone's happy. But if you're waiting for that one minute to find peace, you might be waiting a whole lifetime. The only true way to find peace in this life is in the midst of the messiness and the madness of everyday life. And that requires faith. That requires faith. You know, the disciples of Jesus, they should have been at peace on that first Easter morning when they found the empty tomb. Jesus had told them over and over again that he was, uh, would have to die, but then he would come back to life again. With that information, they should have not been worried or anxious. But that's not what happened. In the story, one of the disciples, a woman, Mary of Magdala, came to the tomb early in the morning while it was dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. Mary was on edge. She was shocked. She couldn't believe her eyes. She was so upset that she ran home and uh, talked to the other disciples and said that somebody had broken in to the tomb and stolen the body of Jesus. That little detail that says that she came early in the morning while it was still dark, symbolizes the darkness, symbolizes her lack of faith. She does not yet have faith that Jesus has risen from the dead as he promised. 
So she is anxious and worried and confused and full of grief. Well, two of the disciples, having heard this from Mary, run back to the tomb, and they found it just as she described it. Empty, but with some important clues. First of all, the massive stone that had been covering the, entry, the entrance to the tomb had been rolled away. How did that happen? Inside, they found burial cloths and a head covering rolled up neatly, separately, in different places in the tomb. How did that happen? In those days, when someone died, they would wash the body, anoint it with perfume, and wrap it in a shroud. And then the face would be covered with a separate cloth, and the hands and feet would be tied with strips made from cloth. Grave robbers would never have taken the time to unwrap the body like that. It would have taken too long. They would have risked being discovered and punished. Grave robbers would never have done that. And the disciples should have known that. They should have known that something amazing had happened. They should have known that something miraculous had occurred. Something out of the ordinary. It should have been obvious to them that God's mighty hand had been at work on that first Easter morning. But they were not at peace because they did not yet have faith. The passage says that one of the disciples saw and believed. But did he? The Greek word there can actually mean began to believe. Because the very next line, did you notice this? The very next line says that they did not, the disciples did not yet understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So how could they believe? They were beginning to believe. And then the very last line, uh, we didn't hear it in the gospel, but it's right after that. It ends the story abruptly. It says the disciples returned home. It doesn't say they returned home in joy. It doesn't say they returned home with hope and peace in their hearts. They just went home. They weren't sure what to make of it all. All those signs and clues were like puzzle pieces that just didn't fit together for them yet. They wanted to believe, but couldn't quite get there. The disciples were not at peace on that Easter morning because they did not yet have faith, complete faith, that Jesus had risen from the dead. In this world, you and I will have trouble. We cannot escape from the disappointments and setbacks of this life. Peace is not about eliminating every difficult circumstance or difficult person from your life. Peace is about having enough faith to set aside worry and trust in God. Whatever you may be going through right now, Scripture says the Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Everyone has the opportunity to begin to believe like the disciples on that first Easter morning. Everyone has the opportunity to grow deeper in their belief in the risen Lord. As we'll see next week, the disciples only come to peace. They only experience peace when they finally believe fully that Jesus had risen from the dead. That's why the second reading says, even to us today, it urges us to seek what is above, to think of what is above and not of what is on earth. The only path to peace, to true peace, is faith. It's faith. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking a lot more about finding peace in this world, how to find peace in this world, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that the world cannot give. God can make your heart, put your heart at rest. God can quiet your mind. God can give you peace. I invite you to come back next week to learn more. This could be a new beginning, an opportunity to grow deeper in your Easter faith, in your faith in the risen Lord. You do not have to be worried all the time. Your heart does not have to be on edge. You can live from a place of peace. 
if you're willing to turn your troubles over to the Lord and make him the center of your life, he will take care of your anxieties and calm your fears. As scripture says, have no anxiety at all, for he cares for you. Cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. See you next week.